Shri, how are we doing today? Hopefully y'all are all doing well. Um, today we're going to be going over gas laws. We're going to start with the basic gas laws today. Now for this, you do need to make sure that you've got a, um, or your notes, you need to make sure you've got something to write with, and then you will also need a calculator for the gas law calculations that we work with today. Um, now, one thing I will say is that we are going to go through some of these fairly quickly. Why? Because this should have been something that you covered in a previous chemistry course. Um, so I will be also linking another video to um, go in more depth into these gas laws. Um, it's basically what we did for pre-AP chemistry last year um, because this was something that we covered over the quarantine time um, with COVID. So um, other than that, let's go ahead and get started on our gas laws. Right. So we have talked about pressure already. We talked a little bit about vapor pressure when we were talking about um, intermolecular forces um, on that day two set of notes. Um, now, for pressure, we do kind of need to keep it in mind um, because pressure is one of those things that can affect how gases act. Um, and so for pressure, we do use these four units right here. Sorry. We use these four units right here pretty much exclusively. Um, sometimes we will use other units, specifically if we are trying to communicate um, our research to um, internationally, I guess. Um, but in the United States, we tend to focus on atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, tor, or kilopascals. Okay, so one of those four is what we typically use in the United States. But again, if we're working in the um, international um, science community, um, we do kind of keep in mind that we have our um, newtons per meter squared, and we also have um, pascals, all right? Um, and so those are just other units of pressure that we could be using. Um, we just don't tend to use them as often in the United States, okay? Uh, now, for pressure, um, the original person to come up with this idea of how to measure pressure was Evangelista Torticelli. Um, and so Torticelli is actually where, Torticelli, sorry, is where Tor, the unit that we work with right there, actually came from. It's a kind of paying homage to the work that he did with the barometer. Um, and so basically in 1643, he used some mercury. And what he found was that if we inverted a tube upside down, um, the atmospheric pressure would push down into a bowl of the mercury and push the mercury up the tube. And so that's what we're seeing right here. So air pressure actually pushes down and it pushes the mercury up the tube. Now the mercury then, we can see some vapor pressure start to build up, and that vapor pressure is then going to be exerting, exerting its own downward force, um, which is what's going to cause that barometer to finally reach what we call that dynamic equilibrium. And that dynamic equilibrium is going to be where there's equal amounts of pressure pushing down as there is pushing up, okay? Um, and so that would be where we actually get our measurement for our pressure, all right? The other thing that we'll use is what's called a manometer. Um, and basically what it does is it actually will measure the pressure of a gas inside of an actual container. Um, and so we get something like this. So we connect it to the manometer to the actual container. Um, and we've got gas pressure built up inside right here. Um, and so what we'll see is that we'll actually subtract those two pressures. So if I've got my gas pressure, so the pressure of the gas, it's going to equal my um, atmospheric pressure minus my H, and H would be that pressure that we've got over here, so that change. Um, and then if I've got a greater than, I would add it. Okay, and so what we're, we're gonna see is that that pressure is going to move the, whoop, move the liquid either up or down inside of the manometer there. All right. Okay. So that is just a little bit about our pressure, right? And it is, again, kind of one of those key factors in determining the um, what a gas is going to do. All right. Next thing, temperature. Now, temperature does need to be in Kelvin. All right. Now, what that means is that a lot of times when we are actually getting the temperature of something, we're going to find that temperature in degrees Celsius. And so you will need to make that conversion. Now, the conversion for Celsius into Kelvin is to just take 
your temperature and add 273. All right. So basically, Kelvin is following that centigrade scale. It's going to follow that Celsius scale. Um, but what it does is it moves the scale away from the Celsius zero. All right. Um, what it does is it represents its zero represents what we call absolute zero. It's the place where a substance no longer has any energy left inside of it. All right. Um, and so it is important that when we're actually doing the math and solving for these gas um, particles to see what they're actually going to be doing um, or to see like, for example, how much pressure they're going to be exerting based off of a temperature, um, we do need to base our, um, our temperature in Kelvin. Um, and so just make sure to remember to actually do that conversion. All right. Um, now, a good thing to remember is that temperature is basically average kinetic energy. It's going to be the kinetic energy of all those molecules in a or particles in a certain area. Um, as a side note, y'all might wonder why I keep going back and can changing what I say in terms of molecules and particles. Particles is a general term. Particles just means any kind of substance. Um, so it could be an ionic or covalent substance. Molecule focuses specifically on um, uh, covalent substances. And so a lot of times I'm going to go back and say, okay, well, it's, you know, it's molecules, yes, but it's also particles. So it does include our atoms um, on the periodic table, and then it will also include our ionic compounds as well. Okay. And so that's why I do keep going back in and re-saying particles when I talk about a molecule. Okay. All right. So um, just as a reminder, again, you should always be converting... Um, from Kelvin to Celsius or from Celsius to Kelvin, but specifically when we're doing the math, when we are solving it, um, you do need to make sure that you are mentioning um, or that you are converting into Kelvin because when you solve in those problems, you do need to solve with Kelvin, not with degree Celsius. Okay. All right. Now, something to remember. The greater the temperature, the greater the kinetic energy. Well, that makes sense, right? Because temperature is, is essentially average kinetic energy. And so if I've got a higher average of kinetic energy, then my kinetic energy is going to be, in general, greater, right? Um, so looking at this right here, this is called a Boltzmann distribution graph. And essentially what it's showing is it's showing that as we move and as we change our temperature, okay, so these are our temperatures all in Kelvin, what do we notice that's happening with the uh, relative number of molecules um, and the velocity that they've got? So if I decrease my temperature, so here's my temperature right here. It's the lowest temperature right here. What we're going to see is that we're actually going to have a average right there. Um, and that top point right there is probably going to represent what the, well, is going to represent the place where the most molecules have a given velocity, whatever that velocity is, whatever they're actually looking for. Um, and so in this case, that would be about eh, three to 400, probably 400 um, in terms of the velocity, which is meters per, uh, meters per second, right? So if I've got a lower temperature, then that graph is basically going to be squished back. Now, if I increase my temperature, what do you notice? Well, you notice that that average, that peak right here, this should still be the most, right? So up here should still have the most um, in terms of our average. But as we move around, you'll see that, or as we add that energy, you'll see that there are more that have a higher amount of energy, but there's also some that have that lower amount of energy. So it's a little bit more, a little bit flattened of a curve as we increase that temperature. And then last, if we increase it even more, um, the relative number of those with that given velocity, that relative number is actually going to be, again, flattening that curve. Um, basically, what we're going to see is that our average is still going to be about right here, but now you do, again, still have more in the high and more in the low sections now. Um, and so that's just kind of something to keep in mind. It's basically just going to um, show us what's actually going on as we change our temperature. Okay. Now, we've talked about pressure and uh, 
we've talked about temperature. We already know what volume is, so we're not going to go into any more detail, but let's look at our basic gas laws. Now, these are kind of the original gas laws when we were trying to figure out what's actually going on with our gases. And so we've got Boyle's law here, we've got Charles's law, and we've got Gay-Lussac's law. So those are the three different basic gas law laws that we actually work with. Now, Boyle's law um, basically is just going to tell us that our pressure and our volume are inversely related. Now, what that graph is actually going to look like is that if I've got a high pressure, I'm going to have a low volume. And if I've got a high volume, I'm going to have a low pressure. And so basically, since they're inversely related, they're going to basically be doing the opposite. Um, high pressure, low volume. High volume, low pressure. Um, so this would be the graph that we actually use to represent Boyle's Law. Um, and the relationship between pressure and volume. Now, here is the formula that we would use. Um, you're going to multiply your original, your pressure one and volume one, so the originals, um, and then you're going to multiply your pressure two and volume two, um, and those should end up equaling each other when you are done. So that equals that, right? P1 equals P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Um, and so when we are looking at this, um, ideal gases. Um, are gases that will obey Boyle's law. So gases that do follow this trend of pressure and volume being inversely related. Um, how I've always remembered um, what Boyle's law covers, um, I've always said boil your potatoes and veggies. And so boil your potatoes and veggies. Boils is pressure and volume, okay? Um, another thing that you can remember is just bat. Okay, and what that means is that boils is going to deal with temperature. Okay, that's going to be the thing that's actually, um, sorry, not deal with, that's going to be the thing that actually stays the same in Boyle's Law. All right, so Charles's Law, um, Charles's Law is actually going to show the relationship between volume and temperature. And what Charles found is that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the Kelvin, specifically Kelvin, temperature. And so for our graph, we're essentially going to have something like that, um, where we've actually got an arrow that just kind of points up and to the right, just like that. Okay. Our formula for that is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Um, and again, remember, when you are solving for this, you do need to make sure you are converting into Kelvin. And you know, I do keep saying that. I do keep repeating that. But it is very, very important, and it is a common mistake that students make. Um, now, the volume of a gas um, at absolute zero is zero. So if it's directly proportional, if I have no volume, I have no uh, temperature as well. Okay. And then as a way to help you remember it, I've always remembered it as Charles is very tall. Um, for some reason, I can't think of any Charles that I've ever known that is not a tall person. So it is something that has always helped me remember what Charles's law actually, um, actually covers. It's covering our volume and our temperature. Now, another thing that you can say is cap. Cap is saying that Charles's law does not deal with pressure. Okay, so if you notice, look at back, looking back at our themes, I've got BAT, I've got CAP, and then I've got Gay-Lussac's Law, which is going to have GLOVE. Okay, so BAT, CAP, and GLOVE. All right, so let's take a look at Gay-Lussac's Law. So Gay-Lussac's Law is basically going to sh explore that relationship between pressure and temperature. So we're looking at the how those two things are related, and what he found was that they are directly proportional to one another. Okay, so again, we're going to follow that same trend that Charles's law said, where if I increase my pressure, I'm also going to increase my temperature. Okay, so V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, and again, remember your temperature must be in Kelvin. Okay, all right, now I have always remembered this as Gay has a uh, PT Cruiser. Um, so a PT Cruiser is an old time, uh, an older car, I guess. Um, kind of looks like a modern station wagon is always how I viewed them. 
Um, and so it just uh, was one way to help me remember who, uh, what, what Gay Lussac actually covered. Um, so Gay uh, went over pressure and temperature. All right. Um, and then the last thing here is glove. All right. And so Gay Lussac. Um, when they did their relationship between pressure and uh, temperature, um, they were not looking at the volume. They're assuming that the volume is remaining constant. Okay. So what do you need for baseball? You need a bat, a cap, and a glove. So that's another way that you could remember those basic, um, basic gas laws. Okay. Another law, and this law actually wasn't covered in... Um, a previous chemistry course probably is Avogadro's law. And essentially Avogadro's law is just saying that if we've got equal volumes of gas at the same temperature and pressure, um, what we're going to see is that they contain um, the same number of particles. So they're going to contain the same number of moles of a substance. Um, for a gas at a constant temperature, pressure, temperature and pressure, the volume is directly proportional to the number of moles of that gas. Essentially, you can think of it this way. If I have a certain pressure and temperature and I want to see what happens with my volume, okay, um, based off of changing how much I have. If I've got a balloon and I blow up the balloon, so I'm putting air inside of that balloon, the pressure and the temperature are essentially going to stay the same for those molecules because the balloon is going to stretch. Now, eventually the balloon is going to get to the point where it actually will stretch and start to exert pressure on the gases as well, right? But in general, at first, when you're blowing out air, it's going to see an increase in my volume because we've got an increased number of particles there, all right? So for that, the number of molecules A, so one, so N1 over V1 equals N2 over V2, okay? All right, now the very last thing is the combined gas law. Now the combined gas law here, basically what it's going to do is take all of those basic gas laws and it's going to combine them, all right? Um, and so we're actually going to combine them and see what occurs when we do that. So what do you need? You need a bat, cap, and glove to play baseball. Um, so P1, V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and solve this problem here. Um, so it says a helium balloon has a volume of 250 milliliters at, in a room with a pressure of 765 mmHg and a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. The balloon eventually floats out of the room into a room that is 31 degrees Celsius with a pressure of 786 mmHg. Um, what will be the volume of the balloon if it if, when it floats into the other room? So essentially, go in, label everything. So I've got a volume here. I've got a pressure here. I've got a temperature here. Now remember with your temperature, you do need to convert that into Kelvin, which means we need to add 273. So this is going to turn into 298 Kelvin. The balloon eventually floats out of the room and into another room that has 31 degrees Celsius. Again, it is a temperature two, right? So that's the second temperature they tell me about. Um, and that it is going to be plus 273. So we're going to get 304. Okay. Um, with a pressure of this, so P2, what will be the volume? So V2. So our formula is P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And this is actually given on your AP chemistry periodic table slash formula chart. Um, so it's not something that you should have to have memorized. Um, so you should be able to find it on the periodic table if you uh, have forgotten it when you get around to that test. Okay. So then it's just a matter of plugging in your numbers. All right. So I have 765. That's my P1 times 250 milliliters. So 765 mmHg divided by my... Um, T1, which was 298, equals, sorry, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, P2, which was 786 mmHg, times V1, or sorry, V2, which I'm looking for, divided by T2, 
which was 300 for Kelvin. Okay, I like to cross multiply. That is how I like to solve these kind of problems. Okay, now when I do that, what I'm going to end up with is 58140000 equals 234228 times V2. Okay, divide both sides by this 234228. And then we're going to get an answer of essentially 248 milliliters as our volume. Okay, so that would be how you do it. You just plug it in your numbers and you are solvent. All right, so that would be your combined gas laws. All right, so the very last thing that we need to talk about is ideal gas laws. So um, ideal gas laws, sorry, and STP. So if I've got STP, STP is what we call standard temperature and pressure. So our standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin, right? Our standard pressure is one atmosphere, which is the same as 101.3 kPa, which is the same as 760 mmHg, which is the same as 760 Tor, right? Um, mmHg and Tor are essentially interchangeable. Um, and the reason they're interchangeable is because Torricelli, remember, is the one who came up with this idea of millimeters of mercury, all right? Um, and so again, it's just paying homage to him. Now, one special condition is that if I'm talking about a gas at STP, standard temperature and pressure, the molar volume is always the same, okay? The molar volume is one mole. So if I have one mole of that substance, I have 22.4 liters. So it's essentially, I have 22.4 liters per mole. That's going to be something that I can use to actually figure out how much of a substance I have. Okay, so here's an example of this. I have 34 grams of ammonia, which is NH3, and it will occupy a volume at STP. So I start with 34.0 grams of ammonia. Now, it doesn't ask me for grams of ammonia. It does ask me for volume of ammonia. Well, a lot of times you don't know that conversion but it does tell me that I am at STP. And so I know that if I'm at STP, then one mole of a substance equals 22.4 liters of that substance. And so my grams of NH3, I'm gonna convert that into moles of NH3. There's one mole for every 17.04 grams. And then after I've converted into moles, that's gonna cancel that out. After I convert it into moles, I can go from moles of NH3 into a volume using that um, STP, that molar volume at STP. So there's 22.4 liters for every one mole. Okay, then I'd plug that into my calculator, solve it, and I will find that I have 44.7 liters of NH3. And that would be my answer for that. Okay. Very last thing, ideal gas laws. Ideal gas laws basically combine Boyle's, Charles, and Avogadro's laws. Um, and when we do that, we get what we call the ideal gas law. Now, the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. I've always remembered this as pervnert, okay, um, or pivnert. Either one works, but it's essentially just a way to kind of help me click that in my mind. Oh, we're talking about the pivnert equation, right? Um, and so... Um, We've got P, which is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles. Remember, you can get to moles using your molar mass if you're in mass. R is a constant, and the constant is kind of dependent on what you're using. And then T is going to be your temperature. So pressure, volume, number of moles, gas, constant, temperature, okay? Now, R, again, does depend. Um, you will be given a, on your periodic table, um, it should have the gas constant on there. So make sure you kind of keep an eye out for that. But here it is listed on your notes. So your R, which is the ideal gas constant, is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin, or liters times kPa over moles times Kelvin, or 62.4 liters times mmHg over moles times Kelvin, okay? What do you notice that's changing? 
our pressure is changing. So the unit that we're using for pressure is basically going to determine which gas constant you use. Okay. Now, most gases are going to behave ideally if we're talking about pressures less than one atmosphere. Okay. And so basically what that means is that they're going to follow the kinetic molecular theory and that we are able to use PV equals nRT. Okay. Okay. So here it says a certain quantity of argon gas is under 16 torr pressure at 253 Kelvin in a 12 liter vessel. Um, how many moles of argon are present? So we're using PV equals nRT. I know that because I have a pressure, a temperature, a volume, and then I'm looking for my number of moles. Pressure, volume, temperature, and I'm looking for my number of moles. And then I know that R is a gas constant, right? Okay, so now let's go ahead and plug these in. So I have 16 point, sorry, 16.0 torr times my volume, which is 12.00 liters, equals N, which is what I'm looking for, times R. Now, which R do I use? I've got three different R's that I could use. Well, I'm going to use the 62.4 um, because I know that TOR and MMHG are essentially interchangeable, right? Okay, so I know that I have 62.4 liters times TOR over moles times Kelvin. And then I have my temperature, which is 253 Kelvin. Okay. All right. So now it's just rearranging this equation to solve for N. Okay. So to do that, we're going to divide both sides by those. So 62.4, which has the unit of liters times tor over moles times K. All right. Now I will say this, when you are dividing by a fraction, you know that those good should be pulled up to the top, right? So moles and Kelvin will be here up at the top. Just go ahead and re-erase that. Add that back down here. So liters times tor. And then multiply that by 253 Kelvin. Now you're like, okay, well, why did I need to do that? Well, you should be going back in and canceling out all your units. So liters, liters, tor, tor, Kelvin, Kelvin. I am left with moles, which is what I'm solving for. I'm going to plug that into my calculator. And when I do that, what I'm going to find is that I have my number of moles equal 0 0.0122 moles of argon. Okay. All right. Well, that is it for our notes on the basics of gas laws. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, otherwise, I hope, hope y'all have a great rest of the day.